So we're going to talk about the human impacts on the environment. A lot of this information is going to be a refresher for most of you guys, but it's still important to go over. So first of all, it's important to note the responsibility that us as humans have had in the climate crisis that we're in today. And the fact that if we've created this problem, it's probably our responsibility to fix it as well. So for background, the post-industrial human activity of burning fossil fuels, for example, oil and gas and coal has increased the concentration of heat trapping gases in the Earth's atmosphere, leading to a greenhouse effect and subsequent warming of the planet. So the Earth's average temperature has increased by 0.8 degrees since the beginning of the late 19th century, and we are on track to surpass 1.5 degrees by 2030 which is the level of warming that the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has marked as the threshold before there are major threats to the basic necessities of life. So some of the outcomes of this warming include um, an increase in extreme weather events. This can be things such as hurricanes, typhoons, heat waves, droughts, and floods, um, a drop in food production, which can then lead to food insecurity and destabilization globally. Um, an increased amount of wildfires, which themselves then release more carbon into the atmosphere and then compound that greenhouse effect, um, a rise in sea level, which causes forced migration and increased economic impacts and changing in biomes, which then can decrease the amount of biodiversity that our planet possesses. And then finally, the big one that we're going to be talking a lot on today is the poor human health outcomes. Um, but I'll leave that for the rest of the presentation here. So <clears throat> other impacts of humans on the environment, we have deforestation, a decrease of biodiversity, increasing pollutant and waste production, and ocean acidification. Next slide, Sajal. Awesome. Thanks, Nathan. So Nathan so well covered the impacts humans are having on the environment and the problems that we've caused for ourselves. And next is the approach of how climate is impacting human health. So the way that we can break this down as health professionals, we love organization are into the direct and indirect impacts of climate change. So in this diagram on the right here, you can see the direct impacts are kind of closer towards the middle of the graph. And as we move outwards, we're beginning to see the indirect impacts. So direct or, you know, the, the actual consequences of burning fossil fuels, as Nathan, as Nathan mentioned, um, with the increasing carbon in the atmosphere, gas trapping, causing heat, disrupting weather patterns, increasing severe weather patterns, as we've seen in the summer, um, causing impacts on human health. The heat dome this summer in Vancouver that I'm sure Dr. Lem will be mentioning later, causing heat-related illness and cardiovascular risk factors, um, respiratory allergies, worsening with asthma occurrences, increasing in children due to air pollution, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So to view climate change as just something that's happening to our environments would be incorrect. I think one of the most poignant ways we can actually consider it is in relation to human health, and it actually just, it makes it hit home so much more. So once again, is that direct impacts are the ones actually being caused by those changing weather patterns due to fossil fuels and the indirect impacts are, being, are the consequences on health and biodiversity. So bringing these ideas together, the climate crisis is actually a health crisis. The World Health Organization recently, um, not diagnosed, but stated that climate change is currently the number one threat to human health, which is, terrifying and insane and just you know it's mind-blowing that we're at this point and it's I think introduces a really really you know a really big implication that health needs to get involved as a sector in climate advocacy. Below I've highlighted some of the actual increasing health risks associated with a changing climate. There's been research out of Australia that shows that increasing ambient temperatures actually increase the rates of aggressive and violent suicides especially for those who are most affected by climate change, for example, farmers. Um, and we know that climate is often linked to livelihoods, for is, especially for people that live off the land and, and people who support everyone else that lives off the land, namely being farmers. Farmer health is our health as well. Increased occurrence of climate disasters can lead to mental health disorders such as PTSD, adjustment disorder, and depression. And as Nathan even mentioned, can lead to climate migration, causing stress on them as well as others. 
increased rates of physical illness exacerbations. So COPD, cardiovascular diseases, renal failure and cancers are all illnesses that can be worsened by climate change. Um, as well as increasing mental health disorders. Economic instability and income insecurity cannot be ignored as this is something that we all will be dealing with. Um, a reduction in social capital can lead to anxiety and stress that comes with that, obviously. And then climate anxiety is one that I think is becoming more and more front of mind. And that's the anxiety that comes with knowing that there's something coming and not knowing what to do with that. So acknowledging that this is real and it's, it's affecting people as much as anxiety does um, can lead to other causes of, or other, other health consequences as well as chronic stress. So I think acknowledging that, you know, acknowledging all of these health impacts has a role for physicians to play in the climate crisis. And we hope to touch on that a little bit throughout this presentation. So here is just a brief visual of maybe some of the messages you've heard on the news or on social media. And we found that the United Nations climate change has really done a great job of showing this in a um, maybe more visual, easier way to understand if we're talking about global temperature warming, warming at 1.5 degrees, 2 degrees or 3 degrees. Really, climate change does have that direct and indirect impacts on human health, as we mentioned in a previous slide. And really, the gravity of climate change as a health risk has been emphasized in that scientific literature throughout the years. And here we have a quote from a recent IPCC report that really states that it is unequivocal that human influence has warmed the atmosphere, ocean, land, widespread and rapid changes in the atmosphere, ocean, cryosphere and biosphere have occurred. And here just kind of moving from a left to right shift on these different pictures, you can kind of see in the far left column what can look like at 1.5 degree warming, the middle column at two degrees and the far right column at three plus degrees. And I think for myself personally, kind of trying to understand those temperatures can be really hard until you see pictures like this. And it really does kind of draw that sense of urgency that is needed. This is one of my favorite diagrams, I think that encompasses how we wanna be communicating and talking about climate change as an impact on human health. This is an image from the Lancet. Um, Dr. Courtney Howard was the first one to ever show, I think, the group of us at, at CAPE this image. Um, and I think it actually, once you take a second to look at it and realize what it's actually talking about, does such a good, like such a good job of encompassing why healthcare professionals should care about the planet, as well as patients, honestly. So the widest circle being ecological determinants of health. So that's our stable climate. It's having clean water, it's having clean air, it's having the materials that we need to provide healthcare. The ecological determinants actually determine within the circle the social and structural determinants. So again, those are the materials that we need to live normal, healthy lives. For example, going outside and being able to like walk from my house to school is dependent on a healthy environment. My you know, ability to run my tap and get water is necessarily due to ecological determinants. And then when we move even closer inwards, we realize that the state of healthcare is dependent on social and ecological determinants. We aren't able to provide healthcare in to the current level of quality that we are if the ecological determinants aren't there. All of these circles prop up one another, right? So the way I look at it is if you know ecological determinants start to change with air quality going down because of wildfires or increasing heat waves causing a water shortage or my air conditioning system shut down because for whatever reason the filtration can't keep up the health of patients in hospitals and the health and our ability to deliver health services is going to suffer so i think this is another really really good chart that shows why everyone in healthcare needs to be thinking about the environment as a determinant of health because it is Another important topic that we want to discuss tonight is health equity. And just to make sure that everyone has an idea of what equity is, I thought this is a great diagram that maybe some of you have seen previously, but I just want to take a second to explain it. So I think when we think about equity, some people or even myself have mistaken that for equality. And so if we look at the equality 
chart in um, this little graph here or infographic, you can see that equality is the basis and the assumption that everyone benefits from the same supports. It really considers us all to be equal. And that means that we all need the equal level of support needed to get where we need to get. I think this is really interesting to compare to reality on the very far left, where in reality, as most of us know, one will get more um, than what is needed while the other gets less than is needed. And um, then to kind of balance that out with what equity really means is that everyone gets the support that they need and um, we all have different needs. And so even further um, comparing that to something like liberation or justice takes it even that step forward to say that all three can see the game in this picture because they don't need supports. And the reasons for that is because the causes of that inequity were already addressed and those systemic barriers have been removed. So just keep that in the back of your mind as we start talking throughout these next few slides that when we're talking about health equity, it's really making sure to give that fair opportunity so that people can reach their fullest potential. And then how can we take that concept of health equity and um, tie it into climate change? Yeah, so if we use that lens of equity that Brooklyn described really well there, we can shift our focus back to the effects of climate change and begin to see how inequitable its effects really are. So the social determinants of health are strong predictors, um, not only in an individual's health, but also how resilient someone is to the health effects of climate change itself. Um, some examples of this um, and how vulnerable these popula populations are um, are as follows. So those living in poverty, those with low socioeconomic status, those with food and water insecurity, those that are unstably housed, migrant workers, immigrants, refugees, and displaced persons, those living in developing countries, and communities of color, including Indigenous people. So something else that's important to note um, is really how unfair climate change really is. So if you start to look at the groups that are going to bear the brunt of the climate change impacts, you begin to realize that they are more often than not the ones that are least responsible for the continued growth of carbon emissions. And these are often populations that are in developing countries whose livelihoods depend on weather cycles and agriculture to sustain their families and communities, meaning they're severely impacted by drought, wildfires, and floods. Um, and ideally, this should be counteracted by developing or developed countries who are able to provide the resources um, that they've gained through their industrialization processes um, to provide assistance to those that need it most and do their, do their part in preventing the worsening repercussions, repercussions of this unmitigated climate change. However, unfortunately, the calls of some or of small developing countries who have been the most affected for the longest time in the most severe ways have been largely ignored by these um, high polluters. And so the solutions are there, but the will to act really isn't right now. And I think it's so important to reflect on why that is. Next slide, Sajil. <clears throat> and so we know that climate change worsens health outcomes and exacerbates health inequities in socially and economically disadvantaged groups. And there are many examples of this, and we'll look at two just um, for reference in our presentation here. So for one, we can look at poor air quality. So climate change worsens air quality through the increase of wildfires, smog, and air pollution. And we also know that respiratory diseases, such as asthma and COPD, are more likely to progress and be exacerbated by these, this pollution. We also know that the groups that are structurally and historically discriminated against are more likely to live in areas with lower air pollution standards and thus be more exposed to pollutants. Therefore, these groups are more at risk of the development, progression, and exacerbation of things like asthma and COPD, among other diseases. Then if we look at heat, um, we can look at our Indigenous communities and those that are newcomers to Canada 
who are more at risk of living in underfunded housing and uh, the housing that consistently has poor insulation and they have a lack of ability to cool themselves down through things such as air conditioning. And so this leaves these populations at particular risk when it comes to things like extreme heat waves like we had this past summer. Um, and this can lead to a worsening of a variety of health conditions, including diabetes and heart disease. Awesome. So I think as we get into these next topics, we want to just take a second to define why we're talking about all these ideas that may seem unconnected and really bring them together. So on this slide, um, there are a few quotes that I think really define intersectionality quite well. Um, and they take the pressure off of me from defining them. So um, I just want to create some space for you to read these, these quotes from an article I found um, and the quotes on the side. I think as we approach advocacy, it needs to be through an intersectional lens, which really truly just means considering all the different perspectives that are going to be disproportionately affected and making sure that we equitably bring those to the focus and address those the most and center those voices the most. So just take a second to read these quotes because I think they really highlight what intersectionality means and then we can begin to think about it as we apply, um, apply some of these things that we've talked about into advocacy. I hope you're all still with us. And I just want you to take a second to just pause. I want you to think about how you would answer this question. When it comes to climate change, what concerns you most? Feel free to type something in the chat. Feel free to say something out loud or just take a second to reflect internally. Would love to see your thoughts in the chat if you feel willing to share. Or this could be a private reflection exercise. That's okay too. We'll keep moving. So we've discussed this broaching advocacy topic, the big A. So we know that advocating to save our planet and climate is important because of all these different reasons. Um, the way that the media represents it is through, you know, coral reefs getting bleached or polar bears starving and ice caps melting or through deforestation um, or through a loss of biodiversity. But we know that as healthcare professionals, we actually have another lens that we can use, and that's through the lens of discussing human health. So as health professionals, we have that lens, and we know that actually through this lens that um, people are actually more likely to identify with climate change as a threat to themselves or as something that, you know, they see input, like affecting their day-to-day -day life and might feel more connected to do something. Um, there was a recent Lancet article published in 2019 that actually defined the link between babies being born in 2019 and, and, their, and um, them being impacted by climate change, saying that no child born at, like in this year will have a life that's unaffected by climate change. And then we also know that climate change affects our old, um, older, more elder populations that are more vulnerable to, to um, influx in temperatures and such. And I think the Venn diagram in the middle is a nice little quote and can bring together some different perspectives. So the ice caps are melting and my daughter has asthma can come together in meaningful conversations about the climate. This next slide, I meant to look scary with all the text. Brooklyn wanted me to break it up, but I thought it was a message. These are all examples that I thought were really interesting to see how the media has been representing climate change. And the ways that, um, am I supposed to do the slide or was someone else gonna do the slide? I forget, it was me? Okay, sorry. So um, the way that the media is actually writing about climate change and the way that we can also vocalize um, the health impacts of climate change as an advocacy tool. So there's a study up or a news article on the top left here, living closer to oil and gas drilling linked to higher risk of pregnancy complications and new study finds. The Lancet report that I was discussing earlier is in the middle and climate change and mental health, how do we mitigate the risks? 
all of these are really, really good examples of demonstrating how health and climate change are related and the lens that we can begin to tell some stories through. Okay, climate change from an, climate advocacy from an equity based lens. Again, as Brooklyn so aptly said at the beginning of this conversation, climate change advocacy is nothing without the voices of those that are the most affected and those that have traditional knowledge that have been fighting the good fight for years. So some of the, you know, some of the things that I've reflected on through the years and through being involved with some climate movements has been number one, to build a group of diverse people dedicated to a cause. So having capacity is number one and a capacity of people who are often affected and can bring diverse voices to your cause. Number two is centering the advocacy efforts within communities and community-based organizations. So again, I think this is a reflection of us not needing to reinvent the wheel. Often if you go looking for something, it exists, especially when it comes to something that's like climate change where it's been affecting certain populations harder and longer than others. Um, finding those community-based organizations, latching onto them and elevating their voices. That kind of goes into the next one, supporting grassroots initiatives. So finding those people-led movements, often, again, people from um, communities that have been impacted more. Elevating BIPOC or Black and Indigenous voices of color and other represented voices, and then taking some time to learn about traditional law knowledge and perspectives other than your own, recognizing that a Western worldview is just one of many. Um, on the topic of elevating other voices, these are some of my personal um, favorite Instagram and Twitter accounts that highlight intersectional and equity-based uh, climate advocacy. So if you want to take a screenshot of this slide and check out some of these accounts, um, a lot of these are local voices. Uh, Amy Buka is an MD from Calgary, um, who's been advocating for climate equity for a long time. Climate Justice Saskatoon is one of my favorite grassroots organizations here locally. Um, and a lot of these voices, I think, are, need to be focused on more. So I'll give you a sec to take a picture and then we can keep going. How are we doing in the chat? Is there anything that we should be addressing? I haven't been looking. I just want to thank those of you who have been putting your comments in the chat about what worries you most about climate change. You all bring up incredible insights and points, and I'm excited for our discussion later. No questions at the moment, though. Okay, perfect. So thanks, Sajel. We are now going to move on into the international climate developments. And the first thing we're going to talk about is the IPCC. So the IPCC is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and it's a group of independent science researchers that work under the United Nations. Essentially, they assess the science related to climate change and condense their findings into reports including summaries for policymakers based on the best possible evidence. So we have a few quotes on this slide, but essentially what they're talking about, um, they're from a special report in 2018 that outlines the impacts of an increase to 1.5 degrees of warming. And they talk about um, the principle of equity being central to the report as the poor and vulnerable are disproportionately impacted by climate change. And the fact that sustainable development, eradication of poverty, reducing inequal in yeah, inequalities would be much easier at 1.5 degrees than subsequent warming. So it's important to note that this report is meant to act as a recommendation to policymakers. And from that, you can see the importance that the IPCC is putting on health equity in these policy decisions. Um, and if you're interested in the IPCC at all, you can visit their website. They have all the reports available online. Um, and keep an eye out for AR6, which is a summary of the current state of knowledge on climate change, which will be released, released later this year. Next slide. So another international development. Um, we want to talk about COP26. But before we talk about COP26, we have to talk about the Paris Agreement. And before that, we have to define what COP is. So COP is the Conference of the Parties. It's an annual conference where countries come together to discuss climate change. And in 2015 at COP21, 120, 
195 countries reached an agreement to pursue a goal to limit global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees. And under the agreement, countries must reevaluate their highest possible commitment to reducing emissions every five years. COP26 this past November marks the five-year point at which the Paris Agreement was signed. And as such, it was a critical point in measuring each country's commitment to mitigating the impacts climate change will have on our future. So COP26, and this was one of the reasons we actually wanted to go forward with this webinar because what better time than now to be talking about climate change when it's been getting so much media attention. And we wanna just focus quickly on a few big wins that came out of COP26 as there is a major work in progress, but these were a few pieces that we really wanna focus on. And one of those being, especially as a future healthcare provider myself and for healthcare providers, seeing this um, sh major shift in focus to the intersectionality between climate and health was a big win at COP26. This was the first time that there was an actual health pavilion um, really set up and a really main drawing point at this conference. Some other major wins that came out of um, this specific conference, um, India committed to a net zero admissions for the first time. However, again, at a goal for 2070, and this kind of brings to light, um, again, kind of inequities and um, the maybe not as much support going to developing countries to help be able to meet those goals at an earlier time. Um, and we also wanted to draw attention to really a sign of increasing accountability and acknowledgement of the urgency in regards to the climate crisis, meaning that major leaders are to be meeting next year and to be setting more tangible goals and making sure that they are holding each other accountable to meet those. Next slide, Sejal. Another piece that we wanted to draw your attention to um, was something that Canada actually signed. Um, this is where 50 countries signed to commit to developing climate resistant and low carbon sustainable health systems. And this here is just an article that went into it in a little more detail, but essentially the two major commitments that came out of it was number one, to build resilient health systems, um, and number two, to build sustainable low carbon health systems. Because really, if healthcare was its own country, it would be the fifth highest global carbon emitter. So with that in mind, it shows that we do have um, really a responsibility as healthcare professionals and um, future healthcare professionals to really try to mitigate that carbon footprint, especially when we are the ones who are always promoting healthier lifestyles. Next slide. Again, it is a work in progress. There are um, major pieces of the puzzle that need to um, be teased out and more efforts put forward. And one of those, unfortunately, um, is seen through the fossil fuel industry. And when we're talking about countries and delegations coming to COP26, fossil, the fossil fuel industry itself did have the largest presence there. Um, also, we have seen that all countries agreed to phase down fossil fuels and reconvene in 2022. However, phasing down and, um, is, and playing around with different wording can be misleading in messaging. Also, something that you may be aware of in the media is we need a change in perspective and a shift in messaging. How often do you hear, oh, it's a record-breaking high today in BC or a new record-breaking low, and it almost kind of shifts that mentality, and maybe this is coming from um, a past um, lifetime in athletics, but when I think of record-breaking, that's exciting to me. So these aren't things that we should be celebrating. And so really shifting that messaging to putting the human into climate change. Think about maybe your own daughter or niece or nephew or grandchild who is having asthma attacks or maybe getting asthma when they never had it before. Um, thinking of your loved ones who are needing to visit the hospital more because they um, are having different health problems come up or even um, just needing to decide, you know, I wanted to go for a run today, but I can't because the air quality is so bad. So these are kind of the ways we need to shift that messaging. Um, and that really is a work in progress. 
Lastly, um, we just wanted to talk about some different medical initiatives. So Nathan is going to talk a little bit about Planetary Health Student Group, which all three of us have been a part of at some time or another. Perfect. Yeah, so we're going to move from all these international projects to some stuff that's a little bit more local. So Brooklyn Sagel and I started working together on climate change related issues through the Planetary Health Student Group. And essentially what uh, the Planetary Health Student Group or PHSG, um, what it is, is it's a medical student group with the goal of increasing the awareness of the health impacts of climate change. And overall, it's acted as a platform for like-minded individuals to come together and work on student-led initiatives. And it's also acted as a springboard for students to become engaged in other climate efforts, whether that be locally and or nationally. And so I'm gonna pass it back to Brooklyn, who is the current Planetary Health Student Group co-president. Um, and she'll chat more about what's going on at the U of S and beyond. We don't want to make this about us, but um, we are really proud to be part of University of Saskatchewan and starting to be at the leading forefront of change, especially in medical education. And as Nathan mentioned, kind of joining up with different medical schools and provinces to um, kind of put that pressure forward and show that as future healthcare professionals, this is something that we will be taking very seriously and putting our passion and time and effort to hopefully um, keep this momentum going. So. Um, our Student Medical Society of Saskatchewan, um, as previously mentioned, there is now an actual environmental and sustainability position. So we are excited to, to see that longevity. And um, it just shows that the SMSS is committed to um, supporting environmental and sustainability efforts. Here we have a poster um, that one of our planetary health student group members made, and it's emphasizing a new sustainability policy that was passed in May of 2021. And um, this was, to our knowledge, the first sustainability policy to be passed at a medical school in Canada. And also, as I mentioned, just some national efforts. It's been a great way to network and work with the um, national body um, that's working on similar work called CFMS. And um, if you haven't listened to our podcast yet, this was a project that we worked on um, and you'll see a picture of it and we'll send it later on, but that is now kind of giving um, some different diverse perspectives on climate change and trying to not only motivate, but inform medical students about um, how they can take that passion and turn it into action. Thanks, sorry. I thought there was a picture of the podcast, so I zoomed ahead and it wasn't. So this next slide is talking about CAPE, which is the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment. Uh, January 2021, so we're at our one-year anniversary, marked our very first meeting of the Saskatchewan Regional Chapter. Uh, we're an interdisciplinary group of healthcare professionals dedicated to climate advocacy, and we're actually we're a branch of a larger national organization, obviously. We are always looking for interested in individuals to volunteer and get more involved with climate advocacy. So um, you can shoot me a message. I'm one of the co-chairs um, and we can add you to our emailing list. But this is something that we're really proud of. It's actually brought together a lot of healthcare professionals in Saskatchewan. Um, and we've successfully launched initiatives such as Prescription Nature. Um, and we're currently working on different advocacy opportunities to green uh, hospitals here in Saskatchewan. So as Brooklyn alluded to, we've had some really amazing support at the College of Medicine to actually incorporate climate change uh, as a healthcare or as a, as a health issue into curriculum. Uh, this year, we successfully advocated and added two hours of curricular time covering climate change and health uh, into the uh, pre-clerkship. So um, the more didactic portion of medical school uh, components. So uh, we co-authored a case study that introduces climate change to be an exacerbant for respiratory health and COPD. We um, created new course objectives, meaning that this material is actually testable. So there's exam questions based on climate change and health now. Um, and we've recorded a podcast uh, that's kind of, that can be found on Spotify if you're interested in looking at it. Uh, it's about an hour long of a really rich discussion with us and some experts in, in, in uh, political advocacy and climate change. Um, that we used and was actually incorporated into medical school curriculum this year as well. 
okay, we did it. Oh, okay, that's chunk number one. <laughs> so um, would like to give everyone, maybe we'll take one minute because we're running a little bit behind just to stretch and take a bit of a break. And then we will hand it over to Dr. Lem. Thanks. And not to take away from your break time, um, break time is very important and I take it quite seriously. <laughs> but if you have any questions at any point or anything you would like us to ask during the discussion period, please feel free to put it in the chat or to direct message Sajel, Nathan, or I, and we'll make sure that your question is um, discussed. Okay, that was the quickest one minute ever, <laughs> but I think we will get started and we'll start the transition of screens. <laughs> So, uh, Dr. Lim, perfect. All right, thanks, awesome. thanks, Sejal. Um, so, I mean, you all had, you know, three people to share 30 to 40 minutes. It's all me for the next half hour. So anyway, um, you probably need that stretch. Okay, so I was really, really happy when um, Brooklyn and, and Sejal and Nathan asked me to talk about climate change and health and in general, my path through advocacy and, and some of my colleagues' path through advocacy. So I'm really excited to share with you my story today because they asked me to share my story. So, I mean, um, it was mentioned at the beginning during my introduction that I, I was once a, like a resident medical expert on a CBC television show, Stephen and Chris. And the interesting thing is right around the time when I started appearing on that show was the same time when I discovered that there was this amazing body of evidence behind the health benefits of nature. So one of, so basically the first on location, um, segment that I shot was in fact about this amazing thing that I'd found, which was the health benefits of nature. So actually what I'm going to do is to play you that clip from almost a decade ago um, when I was when I was talking about those those benefits and it kind of sets the stage um, for my for my uh, journey journey through this climate advocacy. So I'm going to share my other screen. Hopefully this works and everyone can hear it. Can everyone hear that? No, I don't get any sound. Uh oh. Okay. Is there a way to allow me to share my sound, like as a host? I wonder if, like, just playing it out loud. I it is playing out oh, loud. Oh, it is. Oh, interesting. Can you hear it? Can you hear, no. can you hear me? This is Colleen. Yes, we if can you, hear you, Colleen. If you go back, if you stop sharing your screen and go back yeah. to start sharing it again, at the bottom it'll say "Share with Audio." Click that. Oh, share sound. Here we go. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. I will, I will start again. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Hey guys, I've brought you here to my local park today to show you three easy ways you can connect to nature and the amazing health benefits you can get by getting outside. You know, a lot of us sort of feel good when we go outside into nature, but now there's actually scientific evidence showing that our health benefits hugely when we head out into nature. Let's go. We all know exercise is great for the body, but if it's a nice day in your neighborhood, why don't you head outside and do it outdoors? Getting active in nature improves your blood pressure even more than if you exercise on a city street. One study showed that people who exercised looking at nature had better moods and better self-esteem. So to get the most bang for your buck when you're exercising, get outside to improve both your physical health and your mental health too. There was one major study looking at the amount of green space near where kids lived and kids who had more green space closer to their homes tended to be at a healthier body. Oops.
weight and the theory was that that was because they're more active and playing more in the screen space. So minimizing your screen time and increasing your green time is a great way to make sure that kids get more active. So many of us eat our lunch inside staring at a computer at work. But if your boss is okay with it, why don't you take your lunch outside and eat it at a nearby park? Nature is actually a proven brain power booster that will help you focus through that long afternoon at work. Walking for less than an hour inside a park improves your memory and concentration. And actually just 15 minutes sitting in nature lowers your stress hormone or cortisol levels as well as your heart rate. Studies show that just 20 minutes of walking in the park can improve ADHD symptoms just as much as prescription medication. So who doesn't love catching up with a friend over coffee? Next time you grab that coffee, get it to go and hit up your local park for a stroll. Short trips to the forest actually increase your levels of natural killer cells, which are your first line of defense against pesky viruses. In fact, just breathing in the scent of trees has been shown to increase your immune function. I hope you learned some really interesting information that will motivate you to get outside and into your local green space. Imagine how healthy you could be if you added a little green time into your day every day. Okay, thanks. Wow, that's like, anyway, <laughs> it just brings back a lot of memories when I used to live in, in Toronto. I'm going to switch back to my presentation again. So, so that was really... Um, that was really my gateway into climate advocacy. And there's actually research behind that. So I fell in love in nature when I was a young child. Um, spending time in nature actually gave me a sense of belonging. I grew up in a majority white neighborhood actually in, in uh, a suburb in Toronto where often I was excluded because I looked different from the rest of my um, classmates and everyone else on the school ground. So spending time in the trees and in the bushes on the edges of the school ground, spending time in, in the park um, down the street and camping with my family was really what gave me peace and a sense of belonging. And there is research showing, which I'll discuss more later, that people who are more connected to nature are more likely to engage in climate advocacy and pro-environmental behavior. So anyway, I'm kind of like a living example of, of how love, falling in love with one thing, nature actually led me into the climate movement. But it was really, um, it was really having a baby um, that, that and and the reading I did when I had my when um, I had my son here he is at three months old in uh, Montreal that uh, that led me down the path to climate advocacy. So basically, he was three months old. We were in Montreal where my husband was teaching at the time, and um, and I decided, okay, you know, I have friends who are in the climate movement. You know, they've they've been saying to me, you need to get involved. You know, you have this platform with, with your media presence and, and your love for nature. It's time for you to get involved. And there was something that always held me back. But then I started reading Naomi Klein's This Changes Everything, which some of you may have read. It's a book about climate change and how capitalism um, contributes to it. And it just opened up my eyes. I thought like I couldn't unknow what I learned about the effects of about the future and, and present effects of climate change and how we were contributing to it. And then looking down at my baby, um, reading this book, I thought I, I just can't, I can't stay over in my little safe nature and health box anymore. I have to expand um, the work that I do, and so I just started started doing that. And so earlier on in the presentation, we heard that the World Health Organization had said that climate change is the greatest health threat of the 21st century, but on the converse side, it's also the greatest opportunity for improving human health of the 21st century. So, you know, you can see on the left hand side, all the things that will happen if we don't take action on climate change from the effects of air pollution and, and poor diets um, to, to uh, like flooding that will affect our infrastructure. And then on the right hand side, if we if we um, embrace healthy plant rich diets, if we fill our, our cities with green spaces, if we engage in more active transportation, will actually see lots of health co-benefits at the same time that we prevent our planet from heating so quickly. And so this is just another way of looking and thinking about that ecological nest of how our environment supports our health. So as you can see here, 20, only 20 to 25% of our healthcare status comes from what we do in our, our healthcare system. And the rest of it comes from factors that are in, in some ways outside of our individual 
control. We need a healthy, well, they are within our control and that we can work to make these factors healthier, like our like our air, like our environment, um, like access to safe food and, and the sense of belonging. So, you know, I think if there are many healthcare professionals listening to this talk, it's really important for us to go beyond our office walls, to go beyond our hospital walls and start looking to our outside community for ways that we can improve patients' health on a larger scale. So this is a map I thought was going to come up in the earlier part of the presentation, but, but it didn't. And this is from one of the Lancet Countdown um, Canada reports. And so you can see how climate change is already affecting the health of people across Canada. So from impacts on the availability of traditional foods and mental health in the North, to, I mean, flooding, wildfires, uh, heat that we actually saw on the West Coast um, all in the last half year, to increases in allergies and tick-borne diseases, um, to relocation from and stress from coastal erosion and displacement. It's, it's pretty clear that the effects of climate change are already happening and they're going to increase and intensify over time. So what's really interesting is in 2020, um, the BC College of Family Physicians asked me to give a presentation to them about, about the health effects of climate change. And so these are some slides that were taken. I'm just gonna quickly go through them that I presented in 2020, almost exactly a year before all of these climate effects came home to roost. So, I mean, just looking back at this presentation, I'm thinking, my gosh, I was talking about this and thinking this is all very academic. You know, maybe we'll see this in 2050, like maybe we'll see this in 2040, but it all happened this year. So anyway, you can see the first slide here. It's straight from my 2020 presentation, heat related illness. Um, since 2009, we've seen extreme heat events increasing mortality. And here in Canada, we're warming faster than the rest of the world. So we're warming at about twice the global rate. And in the north, it's warming at about three times the global rate. Um, and we saw some of that uh, significant mortality um, in the lower mainland, especially during the heat dome. Um, and it's interesting because actually the interior is hotter um, than, than the coast and the north and the lower mainland. But because we're not yet adapted to climate change, because we don't have the AC, because we don't have the municipal heating plants, because we're just not used to it and the climate is, is changing so quickly, that's why we're seeing more kind of relative um, mortality in kind of coastal and northern areas, even though they're not as hot. And as you can see, the people who are at increased risk of um, heat illness are those who often have the least to do with causing the climate change that's, that's driving it. And this is another slide that I prepared. So we saw record-breaking wildfires in BC in 2017 and 2018. Um, the first, the worst wildfire season in recorded history, 2018. Second worst recorded uh, wildfire season uh, in history, 2017. Third worst wi wildfire season, 2021. So it's just, anyway, I, I think when you kind of stack those stats side by side, you really start to appreciate how much of a climate emergency this is happening and there's a, or is happening. So there are a number of different factors that, um, that climate change drives like drier, hotter summers um, leading to drier soils and vegetation, like increased lightning strikes, like spreading pests like mountain pine beetles. Basically, if you have dry forests and you have heat and you have humans who, who you know, happen to accidentally set fires, it's much more, things are much more likely to go up in smoke, essentially. Um, we've seen that ambulance calls for heart and lung events increase after just one hour of smoke exposure. And within a couple of, uh, within a couple of days, calls for diabetes complications actually increase. Um, and the thinking is that the inflammation that exposure to air pollution causes actually um, worsens diabetes uh, presentations and also because it's so smoky, people are staying indoors and not exercising and reducing their sugars like they should. We've also seen higher rates of PTSD, anxiety, and depression in people who are evacuated from wildfires. And again, the more, more vulnerable people are more, effect, are, are more um, affected by these, these wildfire health effects. And then, and then I also spoke about floods, droughts, and security. So 2020, I said in climate change, um, this is a report that was released by the BC Ministry of the Environment. They said that a one in 500 year flood event of the Fraser River was five times more likely by 2050, which would affect more than a third of BC's population, disrupt our supply chains. And in doing my research for the slide, I was actually speaking with the city, city of Vancouver councillor, and he just kind of casually mentioned to me, oh, by the way, because of climate change and sea level rise, in 2100, we've got these let go areas. Um, and these, all these areas are actually places where my family and I go and walk now. Like we go to the beach, we'll walk along in the river district, we'll go window shopping, we'll stop in cafes. And all these areas, because of climate change, if we, if we keep going on the path that we're going, and we don't adapt and we don't reduce our emissions, they'll all be underwater. And it's my, like my son will still be alive at that point. And it's just the thought of it is 
is almost is mind blowing to me. Um, there are also high high risks of water shortages every. Um, two years by 2050, which will affect our drinking water and many industries. Our glacier area is going to decrease by 30 to 50% by 2050. Um, and there is increased re risk for flood in the lower mainland and coastal areas. And again, this was all very theoretical to me in 2020, um, and increased risk of drought in South Central BC. Something else I wanted to point out, this was also from my presentation, are the impacts of traditional foods and territories um, within BC of climate change and what's driving climate change. So we already know that indigenous peoples um, have lower health status than, than on average other people who live in Canada. Um, and by basically climate change um, is, is reducing, will reduce by 2050, uh, the, will reduce the amount of um, salmon and seafood that's traditionally harvested by coastal First Nations. And this will decrease their essential nutrient intake by estimated up to 30% by 2050. And also, um, we, many of us know, hopefully most of us know by this point that it's the fossil fuel industry that's really driving climate change through its emissions of the actual industry and through burning fossil fuels. And we have ongoing resource extraction projects um, going on within BC. There's expansion of many different pipelines. And in the north, in particular in northern BC, the coastal gas link pipeline um, that's being basically rammed through what's switched in territory without consent um, is disrupting local Indigenous peoples' access to their own camps, their archaeological sites, and also You know, first we started with, with the heat dome, which in June and July killed hundreds of people, far more than the COVID-19 pandemic um, did at the same time. And then hot on the heels of the heat dome was uh, basically the town of Lytton within 10 minutes burned to the ground after they set a new record um, for heat. I think it was 50, something like 51 degrees in Canada. Um, so, and then again, the forest fire season this year was the third worst recorded in BC's history. And then after the forest fires um, came the flooding in November, which again, record breaking, destroyed farmland in Abbotsford, um, cut off the lower mainland from our supply chains. Basically Vancouver was isolated from the rest of Canada uh, because of the flooding and the landslides, which also claimed lives. So there were some media stories that I participated in. Um, that's a story from the Globe and Mail on the left-hand side, you can see where I was interviewed about the heat dome. It's an amazing story. I would really encourage you to look it up. And then on, on the right hand side, this was actually a story that was released on, on New Year's Day um, here, here in Vancouver. It was, I was surprised actually a bunch of my friends and colleagues were emailing me and saying, hey, you're on the front page of the Vancouver Sun about this, you know, this interview that I did about a, a month prior. But basically, I mean, in the winter time, we think, we think that's a safe time for climate change, right? Like we think, okay, the heat's gone, the wildfires are gone, it's time for us to rest and recuperate for the next cycle. But the fact that the flooding came and then the extreme cold um, and snow came, which which again affected supply chains um, and damaged infrastructure, it, it almost seems like it's relentless, like there's no, no time we can rest. And something else I just want to point out is um, what I saw during the heat dome. So, I, you know, I've practiced in northern BC, I've practiced on the west coast, I worked in Toronto for much of my life where there's, you know, air conditioning, and I worked among people who, who typically are healthy, I worked in the student health service at U of T, I almost never, I, I can't even recall the key to, a, a case of heat illness that I'd seen uh, prior to this past summer, but this summer when the heat dome hit, I saw more, I saw like so many cases of heat illness, I saw people with wicked heat rash, tons and tons of people recovering from heat stroke, people with dehydration. I mean, it was it was actually incredible, just the, the sheer volume on, on the temperate West Coast that I saw, which I just wasn't prepared for. And then also, I mean, something else that, that I noticed really, in terms of my own patient population, early on in the COVID-19 pandemic, um, I was expecting, you know, with all the lockdowns that my patient's mental health would really take a dive. I would be seeing a lot more mental health presentations. But the interesting thing was that a lot of my patient population really held on until the smoke came, until the heat came. And then that was the point when I really started getting lots of calls for decompensating mental health, for worsened anxiety and depression. And I think the reason for that was people felt like 
inside was no longer safe and being outside was no longer safe. And when you don't have a refuge to go to, when you can't head outside to exercise or be in nature to de-stress, um, it just basically, it sent a lot of my patients' mental health over the edge. So I think from a personal perspective, treating more patients with heat illness, and, and smoke, um, smoke inhalation, and then also seeing, you know, the worsening in mental health, it, it really, I think, made climate change hit home for me in a way that it hadn't before. So now I just want to move into some discussion, not just about me, but about some of the other amazing um, family doctors who, who have specialized in some areas, in some cases, um, and how they're, they're advancing advocacy. So I think given the speed and scale at which we have to we have to move on climate change, you know, it's important to act on a local level. But really, pushing government and pushing industry is the only way we can achieve mass societal change in the time period that we have that we have to do. And Dr. Courtney Howard is an excellent um, example of someone who's doing that. And and Cape at large, we're at, we've actually. Um, We've actually gotten funding for, an, for uh, an advocacy program where we're going to train up health professionals to become effective advocates um, politically and in their community. So anyway, keep an eye out for that. So Court, Dr. Howard is Cape's past president. Um, she's advocated for, I mean, I can't even almost think of one area that she hasn't done effective advocacy in from divestment to carbon pricing to active transportation and plant-rich diets, the mental health impacts of climate change. Um, it's, it's just really important for us to, to book those appointments with our MPs and our MPPs, to make some noise publicly, to show up to city council meetings and speak when there's a climate vote, to write op-eds, because politicians, I mean, healthcare professionals are some of the most trusted professionals and people in the world, on the planet. So I think when we raise our voice, people listen. And so when, when we're talking about other, uh, other initiatives that we can pursue, I think, What's really important is, is to think about what really is interesting to you. Like what really can you see yourself working on for a long time and being passionate about? And luckily enough, um, as a family physician, it's almost like the world, as family physicians, it's almost like the world is our oyster, right? Like we can speak with authority to almost any area of medicine because we, we deal with the entire lifespan and we, we talk to patients with a wide variety of different presentations. And so if you think about what you're passionate about, you can find a way to direct your energy. So these are, so on the left-hand side of this pie chart are the top four personal carbon culprits from um, eating too much meat on the top to flying to home heating and driving. And so I'm going to talk about four different positions and, and initiatives who are taking action on, on these things. And the other half is kind of a lot of waste essentially. Um, stuff we buy, services that we buy, and things that we do uh, that, that also increase your carbon footprint. So this is Dr. Danielle Marantet. She's a family physician based in Powell River, BC. Um, and I did residency with her in Victoria. And she's a, a plant-based, plant-rich diet advocate. And so before the pandemic, and I think through the pandemic more virtually, she was um, basically conducting patient sessions in, in a kitchen with a nutritionist and certified plant-based chef and teaching patients why and how to transition to a plant-based diet. They would have monthly pot potlucks and Facebook groups. And she saw some amaz amazing clinical results in her patients from discontinuing or decreasing medication to actually becoming more mobile, not having to use your walker or going on vacation. I, anyway, I should maybe take out that getting on a plane to travel thing because <laughs> plane travel is obviously not the best thing for our environment. But anyway, but people, she saw some amazing, amazing health effects. And not only that, kind of like my love for nature being a gateway for me, many of the people who started dating plant-rich diets developed awareness and concern for the environmental and animal welfare benefits. This is something that addresses home heating and cooking. So Switch It Up BC campaign was a campaign that uh, CAPE helped launch within BC. And essentially, it was talking to consumers on a consumer level about the health effects of burning natural gas in their stoves, in their homes. So by the way, it's extremely polluting. If you think about it, burning gas in your home is obviously going to release pollutants into the air. It's incredible that we do that, that so many people do that. Anyway, and also the fact that heating your home with natural, ga natural gas, um, which comes from the fracking fields in Northern BC, by the way, anyway, um, also is a, is a huge polluter. So basically, if you put all the home heating in BC together, it's, it's equivalent to something like 870,000 cars on the road. So we really try to, in this case, um, target individual consumers and educate them about the health risks and climate risks of heating their homes with natural gas um, and vehicles. And we're also, as part of this campaign or, or kind of further on this tack, we've had lots of meetings with different politicians, um, with, with uh, our MLAs, our 
um, in BC to, to educate them about this because a lot of them just don't know um, and try to push for legislative change to basically ban natural gas heating um, in homes on a, on a faster or and buildings on a, on a faster scale um, than they're currently suggesting, which is banning it by 2030. This is Dr. Samantha Green. She is a CAPE board member. She's a family physician in Toronto, Ontario, and she co-founded Doctors for Safe Cycling. So again, dress, addressing that transportation area. So she advocated for the pilot bike, pilot bike lane on Blair Street to become permanent. She's also engaged in lots of public education and media around the co-benefits of, of um, having separated bike lines, lanes and reducing serious injury and death. And she's developing a, pro, a proposal for a prescribe a bike program with Toronto Bike Share. And on the right hand side here is Dr. Eugenie Water. She's a family doctor in Ottawa, Ontario, and it really, really was a personal eco anxiety and grief crisis that led her to take action. And she's really passionate about waste. So what she did was that she initially took action by transitioning her household using zero waste principles, but then she thought, I need to do this on a larger level. So she joined four other women, three of them family doctors, to start Ottawa Reduces. And it's essentially a community initiative to reduce single-use plastics and reduce waste by engaging businesses and customers. And so by this point, I'm sure they have more than 1,500 social media followers and businesses. They've done green team waste sorting at a couple festivals and zero waste workshops, and they're scaling up. They have a volunteer base. So I think a, a really great way to, to beat that climate anxiety and eco-anxiety is to band together with people who have similar interests to you and, and work as a team on things that matter to you and will improve the health of patients on the planet. And so I think earlier on in the presentation, it was mentioned, um, I think it was Brooklyn who said that if global healthcare were a country, it would be the fifth highest emitter in the world. Within Canada, it's responsible for 5% of our carbon pollution. And if you think about it, that sounds like a small amount, but it's actually the same as our aviation industry. And we talk all about how flying is so terrible for the environment. So we really have to look within um, to look at ourselves um, to think about how to reduce our own carbon pollution. So if you're a physician and you're watching this, one of the best things you can do is pres prescribe dry powder inhalers instead of meter dose inhalers. So those wet inhalers actually have propellants in them. Um, norfluorine is one of them, and it's over a thousand times more potent than carbon dioxide at heating the planet. Um, every time you prescribe a dry powder inhaler instead of a, a, a wet meter dose inhaler, it saves the equivalent of uh, up to 400 kilograms of carbon dioxide per year. And it's similar to the carbon footprint reduction of cutting meat from your diet. So I basically it almost exclusively prescribe um, dry powder inhalers right now, unless my patient can't do it. Um, one challenge with this is that a lot of formularies um, only cover uh, uh, the um, meter dose inhalers. So I think that's another advocacy target is actually getting these insurance companies to cover dry powder inhalers instead. And there are other ways on a smaller, easier scale that you can, um, that you can take, like reducing the amount of, um, lab tests that you order and uh, interventions that you order, unsubscribing from paper journals, leveraging your EMR to cut down on paper, reducing single use items. There are lots of ways that you can quickly green your practice. And so um, I was asked to talk a bit about different advocacy projects I've taken on. And this has really been with Cape BC, which is, you know, when I moved to BC in, in um, at the end of 2015, I was looking, I was looking for a way to make a difference, right? Like my son was, he was about a year old at the time. I had this climate awakening when he was three months old. And I thought, well, I can't do this on, on my own. Like I need a tribe. And wonderfully enough, um, Dr. Larry Barzilai had founded the first provincial chapter um, of CAPE in BC. And I, I connected with that group and we've done so many things together since. So upper left-hand side, you can see we organized a letter writing campaign um, to the government to end fossil fuel subsidies in BC during their oil and gas review, which is happening right now. Um, there was a climate vigil that we attended outside of our MLA's uh, office to draw attention to the heat dome deaths and also commemorate them. On the upper right-hand side, I'm really proud of this campaign we organized a billboard campaign and a website, um, unnaturalgas.org, to, to raise awareness about the health, the local health impacts of extracting natural gas in, through hydraulic fracturing in the north. Um, and then also just to, again, draw attention to the health effects of burning it in your home and also the climate warming effects. So um, this was actually the first time that any of Cape BC's initiatives <laughs> caught a lot of attention. So I think if, if you're willing to, in an evidence-based way um, and using your health voice, take on some of these, these 
industries that are that are essentially responsible for for carbon pollution and damaging our health it's a really compelling story so I'd, I'd encourage you to, to do that to consider that to be more gutsy on the lower right hand side you can see this was a meeting that we had with my um, member of parliament um, Minister Joyce Murray, who's responsible for fisheries and oceans, we were talking about the health impacts of hydraulic fracturing and how, how that might impact water quality and fisheries. And then something that I often, often do is show up to um, city council meetings whenever there's a climate vote, give a talk, um, a speech, give a deputation. And now, you know, different um, councillors have reached out, the mayor and other councillors have reached out to book meetings with me and CAPE, you know, to talk about how we can work together on these goals. So it's really important to make your voice heard on, on multiple levels. I also write lots of op-eds as well. All right, but this is actually the baby that I'm, I'm most um, proud of and that really animates me the most, and that is Park Prescriptions with the BC Parks Foundation. So um, we launched Park Prescriptions, Canada's first national nature prescription initiative in November 2020. Um, as of October 2021, we'd registered over a thousand licensed healthcare professionals to prescribe nature um, within Canada, and the movement is just growing. So if you want to learn more about it, go to parkprescriptions.ca, and I'm just going to talk a bit about this um, in more detail. So you know, you heard a bit of it in my my video um, at the beginning from Stephen and Chris, but there's such a huge number of different health benefits, evidence proven health benefits to spending time in nature from improved bone density to reduce stress, to reduce pain post-op, um, to better work satisfaction and reduce symptoms of ADHD in kids. Um, there's so many different health benefits to spending time in nature. And when I discovered this over a decade ago, um, after I had my own sort of time when I when I moved from northern BC to downtown Toronto and was feeling stressed and wondering why I was feeling that way and then happened upon this huge body of evidence um, you know I think it's so important for us as health professionals to, who who become aware of this body of knowledge to share it and so if you um, sign up for our initiative if you're a licensed healthcare professional you'll get your own customized nature prescription file which you'll see on the left with your uh, unique prescriber code that you can use to log prescriptions on our website Stay tuned. In, in about a week, we're going to make a really exciting announcement um, with with a major uh, federal partner about it, about incentives that we can that we that will go along with prescribing nature. So so keep your eye open for new stories about that. Um, on the right hand side, you can see one of our fourteen different fact sheets um, that basically are broken down by adult and child health, and then in different health conditions, and with information about how to maximize your nature prescription, and also how to, uh, or all the different, um, a few different points about the benefits behind spending time in nature for different conditions. So I, I invite you to check out our website. My child is actually banging on the door behind me. I don't know if you can hear me, it's very distracting. Hey, Jacob, could you, could you go play? Play elsewhere for a second. Thank you, sweetheart. Anyway, we'll see if he actually comes in. He often Zoom bombs my meetings. Um, anyway, so so this this is what I was alluding to at the beginning. Why and why, as president elect of the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment, why it's I I think it's so important that I spend my time on on nature prescriptions and connecting my patients to nature. And so, as mentioned, healthcare is a major contributor to global carbon dioxide emissions, as we know. Um, Connecting people to nature improves their health status. Anything that improves people's health status is going to reduce carbon pollution. Um, so anyway, uh, so I think this is a way that we can, in a in a essentially zero carbon way, improve our patients' health status. Also, urban nature makes cities healthier. Um, so from reducing the the heat island effect to improving. Um, water filtration when 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 there's flooding to capturing that flooding to actually direct um, positive health impacts on on children or on children and adults health when they have more nature in their environments urban nature makes our cities healthier and therefore again reduces um, carbon car overall carbon pollution and sequesters carbon also children who have more nature experiences are more likely to become adult environmentalists and adults who are more connected to nature are more likely to protect it um, so I mentioned how people who are more connected to nature are more likely to engage in pro-environmental behaviors beyond just nature conservation, because it makes sense that we protect what we love, right? But people who are more connected to nature are more likely to recycle more often. They're more likely to um, save energy and engage in political advocacy and again I'm like you know a perfect example of that um, so I think I like to think every time one of my colleagues writes a nature prescription we're doing a little bit of our part for the planet also the executive director of the UN environment program has said 
that nature is one of the most effective ways of combating climate change and should be part of every country's climate strategy. So if we fully embrace nature-based solutions for climate change, it's estimated that that can get us over a third of the way towards our 2030 Paris Agreement targets. Right now, there's probably no more than five to 10% of um, global investments in nature-based solutions for climate change, which focus on restoring and expanding and protecting nature um, while dealing with societal issues. So by, by increasing support for conservation and these nature-based solutions for climate change, there's this potential to close this gap between investment and potential. And so I think this is, an, again, really important. And there's, there is zero path pathway to net zero without nature-based solutions for climate change. And I think as a health profession, it would do our, our conservation and, and um, environment friends so much good for us to get on board um, the, the nature and health train. Okay, and this is just a slide that points out um, kind of like heat maps during, during the heat dome um, and land surface temperatures on a hot summer's day. So city greening benefits um, are, are incredible. So shade from trees reduces our need for air conditioning. This leads to lower energy demand, reduced air pollution and greenhouse gas emissions and cleaner air. Um, trees and vegetation also trap carbon dioxide and reduce flooding and improve water quality by filtering rainwater. It's estimated that every $1 invested in a tree returns up to $3 in benefits and especially relevant during the heat dome, shaded surfaces are up to 25 degrees Celsius cooler than unshaded ones. So if you look at this map, this red area, the downtown east side, which is one of the lowest income areas in Vancouver, actually was responsible for 70% of hospital admissions during the heat dome. And it's not only you know, because they're of a lower health status, it's also because the city was physically hotter during that time. So people were more likely to experience, um, like that area of the city was physically hotter. So they were more likely to get heat stroke and heat illness. So green space, tree cover is a huge equity issue as well. And we've gotten some great media coverage um, from park prescriptions. Um, you can see in the it, kind of in the middle upper there, you can see Sejal in Brooklyn sitting there. They did an amazing um, media interviews with CBC and are such great spokespeople for the health benefits of nature. And I think, you know, and this this speaks to um, I think how important it is to find our tribe. Like I think their story of how they met in high school, they ran, you know, they ran in St. Cross same cross country meets, they trained together. And now here they are working together on climate advocacy um, and nature prescriptions. I think it, it just really warms my heart to see that. And I, I feel so privileged to work with them. Um, anyway, so so we've, we've been really fortunate to benefit from, from probably on average more than like one to two media stories per week since we launched. There's really a huge appetite for nature prescriptions um, among both prescribers, um, but also the media. Actually, on that note, I have a couple more slides, but I just wanted to share, I just wanted to show you kind of like where am I, whoop, the kinds of media appearances that, that, that are happening now around um, climate and health and how sort of the story has shifted from me just talking about the health benefits of nature to more the personal and planetary health benefits of nature. So I'm just going to share, uh, one last video here. And so I participated in a documentary um, on how climate change is affecting cities. And they focused on eight, it was a national documentary that City TV did. And they focused on eight different Canadians who are taking action on climate um, in, in their cities. So anyway, I'm, I'm gonna play this clip for you. Spending quality time in nature makes us act in more pro-environmental ways. That's a concept one family physician from BC is using to not only treat her patients, but to help protect some of Canada's natural spaces. Dr. Melissa Len is featured in a new City TV documentary, The Fight for Tomorrow. Melissa Lem didn't learn about climate change in medical school, and it wasn't until she became a mom that she worried about What's the future. Growing on the ground over there. My son was three months old, and I was reading um, a book called. This Changes Everything by Naomi Klein, which is about climate change and capitalism. Just reading and having my baby on my lap, I thought the future that we're going to have if we don't take action now, if, if as doctors, people with really strong, um, trusted voices don't start speaking up now, it's going to be too late. Lem calls Vancouver home and her surroundings focused her action on the thing she cares about protecting most, nature. 
I want to be an example, you know, to my patients and to people at large. If I if I start talking about how important it is to take action on climate change and then I pull up in my SUV, no one's going to listen to me. You know, if if I talk about how important it, how important it is to reduce our emissions and I I live in a mansion, you know, with with eight eight bedrooms and 10 bathrooms, it, it'll it's just hypocritical. Now, Lem is taking her passion one step further with the new park project launched in late 2020. Canada's first large-scale program formally allowing healthcare professionals to prescribe nature as medicine. So when I talk about sleep, exercise, diet, I say, and also spending two hours in nature per week has been shown by research to have significant positive effects on your well-being. So uh, interestingly, it, it is sort of a roundabout way prescribing nature to get people to take action on the environment. Leaning on BC's greener reputation, Lem hopes the awareness of climate change combined with creating a connection with the outdoors for health will add up. The city does have some ambitious goals and some great goals, but in terms of implementation, that's been the harder part. There's a lot of talk about the need to act, but when it comes to actual action, I find there's there's less of that. Oh, what's this plant here with the leathery leaves? So well. Mm -hmm. But Lem isn't dwelling on inaction. I don't get as anxious anymore because I'm taking action, really. If you want to go bearing. You can't be everything to everyone. You can't take every action. I think you have to think about what your priorities are. You know, what do you really love? For me, I love nature. Well, Dr. Lem is one of eight Canadians featured in that new documentary, The Fight for Tomorrow. It explores the climate crisis in Canada and how people like Dr. Lem are trying to change the course of our future. It airs right here on City TV, Tuesday, March 30th. Megan Robinson, City News. Okay. And if you're if you're interested in that documentary, it's called The Fight for Tomorrow, and I think you can actually stream it online. All right, I'm just going to go back to my presentation. So we were really, really proud um, with uh, PARX that we were named, we were recognized at COP26, actually, but, or by the World Health Organization at COP26 as um, one of only two case studies from North America uh, in, in their special report on climate change and health of, of organizations um, that are that are working to to underline the connections between climate and health. So, basically, uh, we were we were named as as a, an inspiring a way to inspire protection in nature as as the foundation of our our health. So we were really proud um, that that message about the personal and planetary health benefits of climate change are getting out there on a global stage now. Really. And so I was also asked to talk about barriers. Um, to to climate action. And I don't know if many of you are familiar with this because a lot of you are in Saskatchewan. Some of you, I know at least one person's here on the West Coast with me, but this was um, a barge that washed up during the massive flooding and the massive rainstorms that we had in November. And it's been there ever since. It, it came loose from its ship and it washed up on shore and now it's wedged on the beach. And in fact, Vancouver uh, Parks put up a sign and they, they named it Barge Chilling Beach. It's become like a tourist um, a tourist attraction. And essentially they have tried and tried and tried to dislodge this barge and they haven't been able to um, because it was pushed so high up onto the beach by the, by the waves and the flooding. So anyway, so I think it really um, rep nicely represents the barriers that you know, we have you know, that, that are kind of challenging us every day when we're trying to be effective climate advocates. So one of them, you know, from a personal perspective, as you just kind of noticed, is time. You know, I'm a parent, I'm, I'm a family physician. There are lots of different demands on my time and lots of us in this, um, who are working in this space, we do it off the side of our desk. You know, like sometimes I have to admit, I get a bit envious of my friends in the environmental sector because this is their job, like they get paid for it. But for a lot of us, this we do this work because we're passionate about it because we want to protect our patient's health. And so it's late nights, it's weekends sometimes. Um, so I think, you know, that's not ideal. I think we do have to pace ourselves and, and give ourselves the space and permission to not be working on and thinking about climate change all the time. But it's hard, you know, again, once you know, you can't unknow. And then I guess the second challenge is also the fossil fuel industry, right? They're so much better funded than we are for decades. They've been spreading misinformation about climate change. Even now there's greenwashing going on, greenwashing going on. So I think, you know, but but on our side, we have had, we have moral authority, we have that trusted voice. And so I think it's even more important for us to continually raise our voices, um, you know, to, to, battle against, to battle against that. So I would say on, on a personal level, you know, it's, 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 it's time and energy, but, 
it's such it's like the fight of our lifetime right so i think it's worth it and so i think also you know sejo and everyone else mentioned this um, during the presentation it's so so important for us to find our tribe we can't do this by ourselves when you join up with a team you inspire each other you you give each other energy when you're challenged you can speak you, you know you can commiserate like i think it's so important to, to find your tribe and Cape, thankfully, in the last year or two has established chapters in almost every province and territory across the country. So I'd really encourage you if you haven't joined Cape already, you don't have to be a physician, actually, you don't have to even be a health professional, you can just be someone who's interested in kind of supporting this health and, and um, climate and environment message, please join us please donate, you know, because we need money to run our activities. Um, and, uh, and, and yeah, just just join us in in working towards a healthy future, because that's what we want for our kids. That's what we need for ourselves. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dr. Lem. That was incredible. And I think highlights so many things that um, we need to be thinking about. And I always learned so much. Brooklyn and I were just talking we always learn so much when you when you present so thank you so so much for sharing everything and honestly actually watching prescription grow through your estimate and your goals of having it launch across the country in 2021 it's been awesome to be a part of that as well um definitely want to say thank you everybody for joining if you have to run that's okay and if you would like to stay around um we do have a few questions we'd like to ask dr lem maybe for another five or ten minutes maximum so um, these are questions submitted in previous or in the chat as well. So if you do have any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat. And we'll try our best to get to them. Um, so without further ado, I'd love to just ask you this one question because it's kind of been top of my mind as we've been talking. How do you manage as existential thoughts and depression about the state of our planet? Yeah, and I think, you know, I said it in that City TV video is you combat anxiety by taking action, right? Like. And I mean, in some ways that you could, that could be an oversimplification. Like I think like the way to combat it is not just throwing yourself into it and forgetting about your anxiety. Like, I think you have to acknowledge your eco anxiety. I think you have to honor it. Um, and then you have to go through your own grieving process. Many people have to do that and then move on into action that, that helps you deal with it in a healthy way. And again, when you start taking action, when you start building your team, when you meet other people who feel the same way you do and are, are just as passionate as you do, I think that goes a long way towards fostering the sense of belonging and also making you more effective. So yeah, doing something about it, I guess, is the way you do it. And then also spending time outside in nature, getting enough sleep, spending time with your family. Um, these are all really important things that help us stay resilient um, and, and help us stay in it for the long haul because this is a marathon, you know, we're not gonna solve climate change in the next year or two. Um, we're gonna be doing this for a while, so we need help. Awesome, thank you. Um, Aaron, I don't know if you wanted to just highlight the uh, feedback survey and then um, we can maybe continue for a little bit longer afterwards if people feel like keeping going. Sure, just super briefly, I just wanted to say thank you everyone so much for coming. Thank you so much, Dr. Lem and for Sejal and Nathan and Brooklyn for your dedication and passion and advocacy on this topic. It's just so wonderful to see and, and really hopeful. So I just wanted to say thank you so much for also your enthusiasm for co-hosting this with me. It's been really wonderful. Um, I did put the link already in the chat. Uh, it should take no more than two minutes to fill out. So I won't say more than that. Just uh, I wanted to yeah, thank everyone again for coming to the webinar. And we we hope to see you again. We hold these monthly. So please uh, do keep in touch. Thanks, Aaron. And thanks to the Division of Social Accountability for having us. It's been great. Um, Dr. Lem, I don't know if you have time, but maybe there's been one, there's one question in the chat above that I think could be interesting from Lyle. I can read it out to you because it's a little bit far up. Um, industry, including healthcare, is the greatest culprit in emission. How do we compel companies to reduce or stop their emissions? Also, physicians are part of the wealthier classes of Canadians and have historically fought tooth and nail when their taxes and salaries are affected. Will our profession actually back us up when the costs of intervention need to be paid? For example, implementing, implementing greener options in hospitals. <laughs> uh, Lyle, that's a massive question. I guess I could be here all night answering this question. Um, 
I think, I mean, one simple thing that we can do again, you know, it comes down to this individual level action, but I think voting with our dollar is really important. Like when we choose more plant rich diets, when we choose more sustainable options, you know, for, for the clothing we buy, you know, or the furniture we buy, I mean, it often it's more expensive, but this actually reflects the, the true cost of creating these goods. Right. Um, so instead of all these costs being externalized um, through polluted water or carbon pollution. So I think it's important to, you know, to try to live our lives as much as we can with sustainable practices, but then also, um, again, like advocating to government to to put limits on industry so they can't pollute so much, right? Like I get, we basically need such a large scale change in, in how society functions that we can't, we, if you if you take it down to that consumer level, it, like it, it, it helps, but we really need systemic level change. So anyway, yeah, just, just getting active. And, and when you see something happening, something egregious happening, like for example, let me, let, let me give you an example. So here in BC, um, our, there's one major natural gas supplier, and they've actually taken up taken it upon themselves to um, create an education curriculum from kindergarten to grade 12, where they talk all about the the natural gas being clean and renewable, and all the lessons like it's entered basically it's lessons about energy, um, teaching kids about energy, and so there's it's basically. I don't know, I don't want to use strong words, but but basically it's to like brainwash kids um, into in, kind of normalize the use of natural gas and get them to think like it's a great thing from, from infancy <laughs> almost. So anyway, so we have a campaign that's happening right now. The cat kind of got out of the bag, but we're writing a letter and getting signatures um, to approach the education minister to ask that this the use of this curriculum be banned in schools. And so if you if you notice something egregious, speak up. Like again, that health voice is so strong that if you, if you write a letter, you can gain support and signatures and, and raise awareness around this issue. So anyway, again, keep an eye, an eye out for that campaign to, to land pretty soon. I don't know what else. There, this is like a multi-part question. Um, will our profession actually back us up when the cost of intervention need to be paid? Yeah, so, so I wanna, um, if you're interested in this, there's actually, uh, it was funded to, I think to the tune of $5 million by Environment and Climate Change Canada. It's called Cascades. And it's, just, I think some people here may be aware of it, but it's a sustainable healthcare initiative that's taking place in Canada right now. Um, and also Canada signed on to, you know, the low carbon and sustainable health systems initiative. So I think there is potential for us to decarbonize um, within our healthcare system. So so I think our profession will back us up. And actually the Canadian Medical Association has made climate change one of its key priorities. So there's, there is a lot of energy behind this. Perfect. Okay, so we do have another question here. It was something that was submitted um, previously and it's kind of been touched on a decent amount through your talk, Dr. Lam, but um, maybe if you could give some action items here, I think that would be very useful. So how do we integrate the climate movement with the health movement? I mean, in so many ways, right? Like, I think I gave a number of different examples of different physicians who are who are taking action on on issues that they're passionate about. So like, basically pick something that interests you and that you're passionate about and find people who are working on the same um in the same area, join your local Cape chapter, meet other people and, and just band together to work on these things. Like it's almost unlimited the number, because the thing is climate change affects every aspect of our lives and almost every aspect of our lives can be used to fight climate change. So it's almost like there's no end to what we can do. But again, I would encourage people to, to, to look beyond individual level action and look more towards collective action, um, actions that push larger communities, municipalities, governments to change. Um, but, but, you know, using something, using an issue that you're really passionate about. And then just remember, remember who you're fighting for, right? Like I think about when I'm tired, I think about my son. I think about my patients. I think about the patients who are decompensating during the heat dome and during the smoke. And I think like, this is, this is such important work. Um, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Be inspired. Think about who you love and, and pick something, find, find your team essentially, I think is what's really important. Do 
Do we have time for a few more questions? You can cut us off at any time. Seriously, we know your time is valuable. <laughs> and you've got my to... son's not. My son is not banging on the door anymore. So like, I feel like <laughs> I admit he was. He was saying, I don't know if you could hear. He was saying, I'm gonna come in now, mommy. Oh my gosh! Open the door, but he never did. So anyway, <laughs> he might. <laughs> he still might. Okay. Well, I'll just put another question out there. Um, again, something that you've touched on, and I think you brought up a great point about CAPE and how you don't necessarily have to be a healthcare professional to be a part of CAPE. Because one of the questions was how can climate activists engage with health professionals, community health centers, et cetera? So I think um, just a general message to the audience is knowing that if you are a climate activist, getting involved with CAPE and reaching out, especially to the CAPE Saskatchewan chapter is a great step, um, especially for collaboration. But do you have any further words on that topic? Yeah, I think a really important role CAPE has played over the decades, I think it was founded in the 1990s, is bringing that health voice to to environmental action. So just because of, again, the credibility that the health voice has and the trust, basically it's like put, put our stamp of health on this. Of course, we want it to be evidence-based. We'll do our, you know, we'll do our research. We'll look into the issues and make sure the evidence is, is there. But then just saying, hey, what they're saying is actually valid and listen to them. Like, I think that's almost one of the most valuable things that we can do. We don't have to pursue every environmental initiative on our own, just almost, you know, Putting, putting the health lens uh, on different issues is, is really important. And so I'd encourage anyone who's active, who's not a health professional, who's active with the environment or climate change to just reach out because we can, I think we can support you in a really valuable way. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Lem. And thank you, Erin and um, the DSA for supporting this and what an incredible opportunity to all get together and have such an important conversation. So with that, um, please enjoy the rest of your night and um, feel free to reach out if you do have any further questions.